the vaccination as well as BNC screening and uh, elimination. Uh, so let's move straight to the talk. Could you please upload the video? Today, I'm Dr. John Ward, Director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination at the Task Force for Global Health in the United States. It's my privilege and pleasure to join you today on this observance of World Hepatitis Day uh, in Pakistan. I want to say uh, hello to all uh, my colleagues uh, there on the program today and, um, and indeed all around the country that I've had the pleasure to work with as we seek to achieve our mutual goal of eliminating hepatitis B and hepatitis C as health threats. Today I've been asked to um, um, provide some information about um, the progress of other low and middle income countries on their journey toward hepatitis C uh, elimination. It's very appropriate to look at low and middle income countries to see how well they're doing because a larger burden of um, the number of people infected with hepatitis C are, uh, are in uh, low and middle income countries um, as shown <clears throat> in this uh, bar graph. Now, what we really need to do, of course, to achieve hepatitis C elimination is to make available the uh, services that are needed to uh, prevent transmission by avoiding contact with contaminated blood and body fluids um, that contain HCV virus. Uh, whether that be improving um, healthcare safety or um, injection safety in communities, particularly among people who inject drugs, and then make testing and treatment available so that people can get diagnosed and linked to the treatment. And in, as we all know on this call, we have particular challenges in all of those areas, particularly in getting people tested um, and linked to treatment. And that, that um, challenge um, is true in almost every uh, every region uh, of the world, uh, as shown here. What I'd like to spend a great deal of my time on today is just to, to look at some of the information shared with us from partners in over 30 countries in the development of national hepatitis elimination program uh, uh, profiles, whereby um, information regarding plans, policies, the status of programs, and the status of, of delivery of prevention, testing, and treatment services are um, in these uh, different uh, countries to help those countries take stock, identify successes, as well as gaps to plan uh, their next steps on this journey toward hepatitis C elimination. So what, when you look at the history of disease elimination, including the successful programs for hepatitis elimination, essential components emerge that make those programs successful. And those components uh, include the um, uh, strategic information to help people understand what is the burden and where it is the greatest, um, the importance of uh, national planning, um, engaging all stakeholders, including political leaders, raising awareness of, in civil society so people understand the threat of hepatitis C and the benefits of elimination, tailoring uh, in your services to uh, meet those particular communities and health systems, um, a focus on health equity so that everyone in the community uh, benefits from those services and no one uh, is left behind, uh, the importance of financing so that the program can be sustained until goals are achieved, and the value of operational research so that you can improve your strategies and technologies to make your program more effective as you move forward. Uh, towards your goals. Our national uh, elimination profiles include about 21 countries that are low uh, and middle income, uh, as shown here. And I'm going to take a uh, examples from uh, um, uh, of those to give you um, a picture of how things are going. Now, of these uh, countries, um, they vary uh, in prevalence uh, quite widely. Uh, this shows you both prevalence for hepatitis B and hepatitis C because both of those uh, have to be priorities when thinking of hepatitis elimination. And there's about 10 uh, of these countries that have prevalences for hepatitis C greater than 1%, which is approximately uh, the global prevalence. 
Also, most of these countries have mortality rates that still are above the mortality target for the uh, global goals for hepatitis C elimination um, for reductions in uh, mortality. So uh, these uh, countries um, have some work to do to achieve uh, goals for hepatitis C uh, elimination. So let's see how that's going. And let's start with one of the first programs uh, in the world um, developed for hepatitis C elimination, and that was in the country of uh, Georgia, which started uh, in 2015. Uh, I was part of that when I was the director of um, the U.S. CDC's Division of Viral Hepatitis. Uh, that program uh, has um, matured and uh, grown over time. As you can see here, over 159,000 people have been identified as HCV antibody positive. Um, about over 103,000 are positive for current infection. Um, about 82,000 <clears> have initiated treatment with a 99% uh, cure rate. Uh, the program estimates about 80% of adults uh, in um, Georgia uh, have been tested uh, for hepatitis uh, C. <clears throat> when they lay out uh, what they feel like or their strengths in their program is very much um, uh, aligned with those essential components I mentioned earlier. The value of a, a public awareness campaign, uh, registry so that you can understand um, how good your program is performing, as well as helping persons uh, receive the services that they need, decentralizing testing and treatment to expand access throughout health systems, um, point of care testing availability to lessen that time between testing and the initiation of, of treatment, um, and the other efforts to improve the quality of the health system. Um, so what has happened in Georgia is the reduction in prevalence from 5.4% to 1.8%. Uh, the death rate still is high uh, than that national target, um, and they still have some work to do improving um, access to safe new and, and syringes for people who inject drugs to reach that 200 per ex uh, exchanges of the clean equipment per person who inject drugs per year. Um, although they have done a remarkable job of expanding testing and treatment into drug and treatment programs, they recognize that they, they need to continue to improve access to testing in the, and treatment in the country to achieve their elimination goals. Now let's look at Mexico uh, in the Americas uh, with an estimated prevalence of hepatitis C that could be over 2%. Their mortality rate is 11 per 100,000, again, far above uh, the target for 2025. And of concern, they, they estimate their incidence and mortality for hepatitis C is on the rise. Access to clean injection equipment is not widely available uh, in the country, and they don't have good data to monitor the number of people being diagnosed and treated. On the positive side, they have developed a um, uh, testing recommendations that include pregnant women, uh, and they have uh, developed um, uh, treatment guidelines that include decentralization uh, of care um, uh, beyond specialists and have removed uh, uh, pay uh, as a barrier uh, for patients. Uh, innovations they're proud of is a data management system so they can began to monitor more effectively the number of people uh, tested and treated. Uh, they have developed a care guide to improve clinical training um, uh, so that their um, more clinicians are prepared to care and treat uh, hepatitis C. They started their program focused on their HIV clinics, and they've done a remarkable job of improving um, uh, the access to hepatitis C treatment for people with HIV. Um, and now they're going to uh, move uh, beyond the HIV clinic to primary care. So their next steps is continuing to improve their uh, strategic information system. Um, they want to develop a national uh, action plan for the first time for hepatitis C, and they want to um, continue to improve uh, public awareness so that the uh, commitment to the program will grow. 
Now let's look at Myanmar in the, the Southeast Asia region, um, a country with a, a prevalence of uh, anti-ACB, about 2.65%. Over half of the prevalence is among people who inject drugs. And again, they have a mortality rate that's quite high uh, um, that's related to hepatitis C. And again, they believe based on their uh, available data that mortality may be on the rise. Positive note, they have over 351 uh, exchanges per PWID per year, uh, very broad access to a critical intervention. Um, they are also seeking to uh, make testing and treatment more widely available, uh, guided by a national technical advisory uh, committee, but they recognize that they have uh, laboratory uh, limitations in their capacity uh, for, uh, for HIC uh, testing. Um, on the positive side, the government uh, is lowering uh, uh, the cost of treatment uh, by uh, negotiating reduced costs uh, for um, ACV treatments and reducing um, the, uh, the need to pay for many patients uh, in the country. And their next steps for elimination is to uh, develop a national strategic plan and, and, and then seek additional resources so that they can scale up their program. Let's look at Ghana uh, in Africa, a country that estimated prevalence of about uh, 3%, although their uh, mortality rate appears to be uh, lower than the uh, global target for, uh, for HCV-related uh, mortality. Uh, but their data uh, quality uh, is not good in the, in the country um, as, as shown here. Um, uh, and and um, they really have not yet developed good ACB uh, testing guidelines or uh, treatment guidelines uh, for the country. Um, and uh, they recognize the uh, lack of data as a particular uh, problem, as well as the lack of um, uh, guidelines for testing uh, and treatment. There has been some achievements along the way. There, you know, there are some of those achievements are related to hepatitis B, but they are in the process of developing national uh, treatment guidelines for hepatitis C, and uh, they, uh, they've improved their technology so that they can make clinical training more widely available uh, throughout the country. Um, and, you know, on a very positive note, the national government has recognized the importance of working with um, non-governmental organizations to improve outreach uh, in communities. Um, we've been involved in um, supporting a Global Hepatitis Elimination Fellow, Dr. Yvonne Nardi, um, in the country where uh, it, she did a very thorough assessment and found that the prevalence may be even higher than the 3% previously uh, estimated, particularly in the northern part uh, of the country. Uh, that um, uh, information was shared uh, uh, at multiple meetings of uh, multiple stakeholders, including community-based organizations, which prompted more um, outreach uh, services for HCV uh, test, uh, testing. Uh, we, uh, we also um, um, brought together the government of Egypt with the government of Ghana, um, as the government of Egypt had pledged uh, free HCV medications to treat up to 1 million persons in Africa that have hepatitis C. So this was an opportunity to begin to support the launch of an HCV program in Ghana that is called Locally Stop Hep C. And on March 1st, there was a formal um, sharing of those medications by the ambassador uh, for Egypt to Ghana uh, to the Ministry of Health. And the uh, testing and treatment for hepatitis C is now underway in the country. And part of Ghana's steps to see how they can improve multiple
Hi, John. Uh, can you hear us? Hello. John, are you there? I think there might be some connection issues. Thank you. He's not. Uh, uh, I think there's uh, some interruption with the internet activity. I'm not sure whether John can hear us. John, could you please respond if you can hear us? We're trying to fix the problem. Elizabeth, um, I can't see. <clears throat> I think uh, meanwhile, we are uh, trying to fix the issue. Uh, we can request the next speaker, perhaps. We might have to juggle with the order. Uh, okay. uh, so I, I think let's move on. Uh, our sincere apology to the speakers uh, because of internet uh, issue. So it, it is my pleasure to... Re let, let me check. Uh, guys, are you back? Okay, we need to liberate. Uh, uh, John, uh, can you hear us? I, I think you need to unmute your mic. Yeah, up your control, may I mic? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, mean, while we are facing the technical issue, we warmly welcome uh, His Excellency, Caretaker Health Minister, Professor Javeda Karam. Please uh, welcome.
Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, meanwhile, we we are uh, trying to sort out the issue. Professor Javed Akram is uh, the health minister. He is a renowned uh, academic, a clinician. Uh, he has a heavy e portfolio uh, in sense of contributions in medical education. And we are sincerely obliged uh, for gracing the occasion today. Uh, John, I believe you can hear us now. I can. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, we we offer sincere apology for this great inconvenience because of internet uh, activity and issue. Uh, we actually couldn't complete your talk. Still, a few minutes left. Mean we. Meanwhile, we are trying to fix the issue. I would like to open the session for any possible question which audience might like to ask from the John. Uh, anyone holding the mic, please? Well, since I am live and while you're waiting for questions, let me just um, uh, say hello to everyone on this observance of World Hepatitis Day in Pakistan and just uh, to thank uh, uh, the colleagues that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, over the years and the uh, opportunities to expand that uh, group of colleagues in the future as uh, Pakistan is, um, uh, again, uh, recommitting itself to hepatitis elimination as we emerge from the pandemic. Right. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, John. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Say, Doctor. Uh, we had brief meeting and then, you know, Decide, discussed about what we can do for Pakistan. And thank you for joining us at a very odd time uh, from your schedule. Uh, and you obviously missed some very delicious food yesterday <laughs> from Pakistan. Um, so we actually, it seems like our thought process is taking a shape. The government has been very serious and we have the health minister sitting next to us. Uh, and yesterday the prime minister launched the hepatitis C elimination project and committed 35 billion rupees over seven years. Uh, so I think we are heading in the right direction. Now the task lies with us uh, that how to devise a program which is foolproof and entire day today we had been discussing that we really need to develop a very strong communication strategy. We really need to develop a good uh, electronic medical record system so that we are all connected, maybe some um, tablet-based uh, technology. Uh, we need to decentralize the, the whole cascade of uh, uh, treatment, uh, make treatment more simpler, less visits, maybe even engage uh, nurses or lady health visitors 
as a first point of contact with the patient. So these are the kind of lines that we are thinking and just wanted to see what, what your thought process on that. Well, I think all those um, efforts are, are in the right direction as I uh, tried to outline in my uh, remarks, how you put together those essential components and you touched on you know, a number of those just in your brief remarks uh, now, the importance of uh, um, good data so you can really uh, understand um, the, the size of the problem and where it's, uh, the problem is greatest and then help you track uh, how your program is going uh, along the way, uh, the value of um, integrating that into the health system in a, in a way that's really feasible, um, and the pilot programs I'm sure that you touched on yesterday and that we're involved in are examples of how um, they shine a light on the way forward. And then the really importance of engaging the community, including political leaders, um, along the way to help them feel uh, like they're a part of the issue uh, and part of the program. They understand why the program's important uh, and you have transparency as you move forward so that they really have trust uh, in the program and they and so the commitment uh, is sustained uh, along the way. I think you also touched on an important point of um, information sharing among all the persons working toward improving prevention, testing and treatment for hepatitis C uh, in Pakistan. Now I'm impressed you have a, a, a large number of highly capable people with strong commitments to hepatitis elimination, and you know, they're working in their programs uh, uh, throughout the country and really uh, creating that coalition of uh, programs so that they can share lessons learned and, um, and be more uh, effective uh, as a result is really uh, important. Um, and um, uh, that's why I feel so committed to coalition building because you see how that is uh, effective in other uh, countries and will only increase the effectiveness um, in, in Pakistan. Uh, lastly, it's really great to hear that the uh, Prime Minister has committed this to a seven-year program, because elimination doesn't happen overnight. You know, it, uh, it has to be a, a commitment for an extended period uh, to change the uh, services that are available, change uh, pr uh, clinician behavior, and increasing public awareness so they step up and um, request and, uh, and accept these services when they're offered. And so I think uh, being uh, looking uh, for a program over seven years uh, uh, and with the capability that's um, uh, evident in Pakistan, you know, I believe you'll be highly successful um, when uh, that seven year program uh, is over. And I just wanna, again, uh, you know, commit the, um, um, the coalition's um, participation in, in helping make that program successful. Thank you. Appreciate it. And also wanted to let you know that we have uh, uh, Dr. Vakit from, from Egypt. Uh, we had a very detailed discussion with him and learned a lot of good things from him. So I feel that with people like you and uh, Dr. Vakit and the rest of the world, which is a small village now, we will be able to and then we have a head start. We have a lot of experience that a lot of other countries have, and we can pick up the best of the practices from the rest of the world and try to make it as efficient as possible. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree. I, and again, I, I think that's evident in the program you're putting on here uh, today. Um, uh, you've, uh, your, your earlier pilot projects have revealed a, a number of a, a very effective strategies for the country. Just again, putting that all together and keeping that coalition strong, building that political commitment. Um, and for this seven year program, again, I think you're going to be highly successful. And I look forward to working with you in that regard. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you, John. Uh, certainly, uh, we would be in a strong collaboration with your good self. And as Dr. Sayyid Akhtar mentioned, uh, that we have learned a lot of strategies from Egyptian model. And we believe a stronger commitment and collaboration with international community will ease our job and will direct us in the right direction from the lessons which has already been learned. So on behalf of the PKLI and a whole of its management and health professionals in Pakistan, we are greatly obliged and thankful for your very kind time for, uh, for such a wonderful talk. And once again, we offer our apology for interruption due to <laughs> activity. Uh, okay. you know, the life is full of challenges, you see. Uh, yes. Hope to see uh, you. 
Thank you. Can I say one last comment, if I may? What we did not apparently get on the video was the uh, the launch of a United Nations group of friends to eliminate hepatitis that is being led by the government of Egypt, um, where about 30 countries have expressed a commitment to hepatitis elimination. A second meeting of that uh, UN group will be held on September 22nd in New York. And I uh, would really like to see uh, the participation of your organization and of the government of Pakistan um, in that uh, group of friends meeting. And I'll send you more information about that. So right. That so I had conveyed them. your uh, invitation to the prime minister. And uh, by that time, I don't think he will be the prime minister, uh, but he will pass it on to whoever the interim government person is. And we will try to push that our even interim prime minister should participate in that meeting to show the world that we have commitment against hepatitis. Thank you very much. And a formal invitation will be forthcoming. Thank you again. Thank you, John. It was a great pleasure. Uh, uh, our next uh, speaker uh, would be Professor Philippa Easterbrook. Uh, Philippa, can you hear us? I can hear you well. Um, and if the screen sharing, oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Let uh, me just. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, next speaker, Philippa Easterbrook, is a renowned clinician, does not require much of introduction. She has an extensive experience and work in the field of viral hepatitis. She worked as an epidemiologist, infectious disease consultant, and as a professor at King's College Hospital London. She currently leads the WHO Global Hepatitis Program, and she will be delivering a talk today on new opportunities and directions for elimination of viral hepatitis in Pakistan. Over to you, Philippa. Thank you so much. Um, and really, congratulations on this excellent meeting, superb presentations. I, I really uh, learned a lot and updated myself where things are at in, in Pakistan. And, and I'm so sorry not to be with you in, in person, despite the best efforts of Amara, many others, talk to Pasha. Um, uh, the gods were not on our side. And so I, I'm so sorry not to be there. And in, indeed, the last time I, I attempted to come to Pakistan in March 2020, as a follow-up to the micro-elimination project in uh, Nankana Saab, where we were planning to move to another district, um, COVID struck. And, uh, uh, and uh, so the gods weren't on our side uh, uh, on that occasion either. But I, I should say before I begin my presentation, I've had the opportunity to have several visits uh, uh, the last being in 2019, where we did a, a mini program review also. Um, and I had the opportunity particularly to spend time with the Punjab Hepatitis Program, which I think is uh, and was outstanding. Um, I, I think we were all hugely impressed by the many sort of innovations, the electronic health record, the dashboard, the sample transport system, the integration of hepatitis B and the vaccination uh, of those uh, who are negative um, in the, uh, at the sites, the access to low cost generics. Um, these are, were all the markers of a, a really impressive program. And I think going forward, I think our shared mission at WHO is to really profile the excellent work and good practices so that Pakistan really receives the recognition um, uh, uh, it deserves uh, and as a champion country going forward. So in this uh, presentation, um, I've uh, changed it around because I think uh, Professor uh, Saeed did a, a, an excellent job on the decentralization. So I've changed many of the slides. And the main sort of uh, steer for me with this presentation was to share and ensure everybody is aware of some of the range of WHO products. Um, and so I will just finish with really what was the original title of my talk on some priorities for, for, for Pakistan, which I, I think have been well covered by some of the other presentations. So a really uh, a gallop through um, some of the key WHO products. Um, so this is just a timeline of our different activities and products. And many of you will be aware in 2016 was really the first global health sector strategy 
on viral hepatitis, uh, which set the ambitious targets for elimination of hepatitis C and B as a public health threat. And there has now been an update uh, to the strategy, and I will just touch on that briefly uh, first. And then along the bottom, we have really the main guidelines, 2015, the hepatitis B, the hepatitis testing guidelines in 2017, and then the four iterations of the hep C guideline, most recently with the um, 2000 um, and, and 22. And then the other document I will make reference to is the country validation interim guidance for viral hepatitis elimination, which has now just been updated um, and will be available online in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and I'll make a quick reference to the latest hep C guidelines, um, uh, touching on a few other points um, that were not covered by Saeed, and then mention the hep B guidelines. Oh, let me just see. Why uh, isn't it advancing? Um, oops, for some reason, the slides are not advancing. Um, is there a reason for this? Um, if they could be advanced for me, um, that's good. Um, to the previous slide, please. It seems. Um, right. Now I seem to be able to advance. That's good. Thank you. So I think just to touch on the latest iteration of the integrated um, HIV, viral hepatitis B and C and STI strategy. And this is taking us up to um, uh, 2030 now with five strategic directions and with on the right the key interventions that are an integral part of the hepatitis response. And I will just very quickly highlight some key points for each of these strategic directions. And I think um, the some of the key shifts and areas for prioritization in 2023 um, shown the priorities for viral hepatitis shown in green, and they really reiterate and reinforce um, uh, many of the messages that have already emerged from the uh, presenters today, the need to raise the public awareness, the importance of community civil society engagement, the scale up of hepatitis B birth doses, uh, key prevention, uh, the continued invest investment in primary prevention, and that includes uh, hepatitis C, the access to testing and treatment, the decentralization. So on the strategic direction, one, the importance of evidence-based people-centered services and the key WHO products to really address this. And that includes the um, triple elimination initiative for um, um, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, the testing guidelines, the treatment guidelines, and the simplified service delivery. And the overall aim is to consolidate both the B, the C, the testing, the prevention into a consolidated hepatitis guidelines products. We're also working with a number of companies for the potential development of a simplified app to make the treatment guidelines more accessible. Uh, next slide, please. For some reason, it's not letting me advance to the next slide. If the next slide can be advanced, I'm not quite sure why it's not advancing. Next slide, please. Um, I think it may well be that you need to take control because the slide is not advancing at my end. Can this be done manually? Be trying, trying to work it out. Thank you. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not quite sure what is on my next slide, so it's a little difficult to to, um, to comment. Um, but the strategic uh, uh, direction um, two, three, and four um, uh, cover both the um, uh, also the elimination guidance, which I've mentioned, has just been updated. Uh, with the criteria for the validation of elimination as a public health threat. And what is new 
is the um, path to elimination. So this is to recognize those countries who've made considerable progress, but because of the high burden, um, may not yet uh, be reaching, for example, the mortality um, targets, recognizing that it takes uh, some years um, to impact on the mortality uh, target. So this path to elimination, um, oops, it is now advancing. Um, and I will return to the path to elimination shortly. So this is the elimination guidance um, and also profiling the products of a guidance for national strategic planning and a guidance for conducting program review, similar to the mini one that uh, we did in Punjab a few years ago. And then as has been emphasized in this meeting already, the critical importance of good data to drive decisions for action. And the um, case definitions and some of the technical issues for surveillance for viral hepatitis, a WHO product shown there on the left, is now being updated and will be available in 2024. And similarly, the Global Progress Report, last done in 2021, based on 2019 data, will be updated also and launched in 2024. So innovations for impact, I think um, uh, there is uh, interesting work uh, and we're keeping a watching brief on the long-acting um, DEAs. Um, also on the progress with hepatitis B cure. Um, other innovations include the long-acting buprenorphine for the uh, um, uh, opiate uh, administration, single-use syringes, and some service delivery innovations um, with a product recently on primary care and HIV. Um, and I think uh, finally on the importance of empowering communities and civil society who need to be center stage in, uh, in the response. So moving now to the elimination guidance, another important uh, product from WHO, um, uh, and this was launched in 2021, and really is a global framework that comprise both elimination criteria as well as the governance process for country validation of uh, hepatitis B and C as a public health problem. And this is really to motivate countries to really accelerate action on hepatitis elimination and really making um, uh, ensuring that the process is country led and placing the elimination efforts within a public health response. These were the validation criteria, both the impact criteria, as well as the program uh, coverage criteria, and the impact targets being incidence and mortality. And we very much went down the route of absolute targets rather than the original relative reduction targets, because this really enables direct comparison across countries of progress towards elimination um, um, and is, uh, is, is a level playing field and really avoids the need to have a baseline incidence or mortality, which has certainly been challenging in some countries. So this is what is new. And this is the path to elimination um, with a bronze and silver and gold. Um, so like the Olympic medals, we already had a path to elimination for mother to child transmission, validation of that. But this was new for the overall hepatitis B and C uh, elimination. And you can see this focuses entirely on program targets, not on impact targets of, of incidence and mortality with a gradation of the proportion that need to be diagnosed and treated to meet the eligibility. And we already have a number of countries who are starting to put together dossiers for, um, for validation for path to elimination. You've already seen this slide, and I think this is just uh, such an important slide to for, for it to be recognized um, how, how far we still have to go um, with this major testing and treatment gap. Um, and this is not specific to um, uh, uh, Pakistan at all. This is a universal global um, uh, challenge. 
um, uh, although uh, is particularly striking for hepatitis B. This slide has already been shown, and this really reflects the approach we're also adopting with hepatitis B. And uh, we took our lead from HIV, where there, ha there was that progressive simplification of the guidance, the treatment regimens, um, and the service delivery. And so uh, as an infectious disease and HIV physician, I have really uh, borrowed so much from the HIV experience to guide our approach. So this simplification was done much faster with hepatitis C. Hepatitis B represents more of a challenge, um, but I think the new guidelines, which will be coming out in a, in a couple of months, will be an important step forward for hepatitis B. Um, uh, Syed has already shown this slide of this was really center stage to the new recommendations, the decentralization, integration and task sharing. And I think um, I just wanted to share on the right, um, uh, given the importance of uh, uh, building the capacity and health worker training and primary health care physician training, we've recently done a mapping of all the online training materials that are available. Um, that could be built on. And I know that PKLI had a really excellent training program. Uh, we've also done a um, uh, an overview of the ECHO training for hepatitis uh, with a, a review of global experience. Um, and I'm pleased to, to say that uh, both the Aga Khan and PKLI um, training programs uh, were featured. And you may all remember being interviewed about this a number of years ago. So these are the, um, the former testing uh, guideline recommendations. In blue, you see what we recommended um, um, for both for testing who to test, as well as how to test, um, shown in blue, and on the right, some of the updates. And I think given the discussion now about the general population testing, this is exactly what we recommended in 2017, that in settings with uh, an intermediate high prevalence that really um, testing should be made available to the whole population and not just confined to focus testing, although that needs to that needs to complement the uh, general population testing. And then in terms of the new dimensions of the recommendations, we now have recommendation for self-testing as another uh, option uh, available to access testing, and also a recommendation on the use of point of care viral load um, uh, as an alternative to lab based and the use of reflex viral load testing as well, which is hugely important. And I think I just want to emphasize that, uh, and Sai has already shown some of the evidence base that supported these recommendations, but we, in, as part of our WHO guidelines, uh, are very conscientious about seeking the community views and uh, acceptability of approaches. And this was data from a, a large global survey that was undertaken with our partners, um, really highlighting the patient views and preferences that really um, um, the view was that um, patients wanted to have testing and viral load confirmation available in primary care community-based organizations. And people would like the initial test and the confirmatory viral load on the same day and in the same place where possible, and to start treatment on the same day if they had a positive viral load, and for testing and treatment to be in the same place. And that really, I think these quotes are just saying, I struggle to do the doctor's appointments. The less places and times I have to go, the better, and the more likely I am to get them done. So that message comes across loud and clear. I think Saeed has already mentioned about the uh, point of care. I won't review the evidence again, other than to demonstrate that, particularly for key populations, uh, those uh, uh, persons who inject drugs, drug treatment programs, that really access to a point of care test can really facilitate retention. Um, and these point of care platforms can be used at lower level health facilities. And the opportunity, of course, for integration, which I think Amara alluded to, um, and really the efficient use of some of these platforms. 
I think I've become a little bit of a reflex viral load testing bore. I talk about it a lot. And again, the evidence base was really strong for that, that where it's in the lab, you immediately reflex if it's a positive hep C antibody to doing the viral load and where it's in the clinic, you immediately take a, a sample as soon as you have the positive RDT. And I know that uh, uh, Amara was talking about people don't wait for 20 minutes, um, but I think it's really important. Um, we almost don't let them uh, uh, leave until they've had their viral load. Um, uh, the, the result has come back and uh, the, the sample has been taken. And really this reflex testing can considerably simplify the care pathway um, and avoids the need for additional blood draws. So I think I just wanted to mention some of the implementation considerations. It's important that countries are looking and mapping their diagnostic infrastructure and then really making the strategic choice about where lab-based lab and centralized testing makes sense and what might be some of the strategic positioning of point-of-care platforms, for example, at harm reduction sites. Um, and we also found that the optimal placement of a point of care instrument is where testing and treatment are at the same site, the so-called one-stop shops. And the same applies to looking strategically about where lab-based reflex testing makes sense and where clinic-based reflex specimen collection. So again, I just wanted to flag the other important recommendation in the Hep C guidelines was on the um, uh, the recommendation for treatment now down to the age of three years and using the same regimens, the same recommendation, recommended regimens as for adults to be used in adolescents and children, that's SOFTAC, SOFTVEL, and also GP. Um, um, but what is critical really is the case finding. And that is why national testing programs, particularly in a, 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 the case of um, certain countries, is to ensure that the children and adolescents are tested at the same time, be it through school-based testing or as part of the community testing. Case finding is key. So moving now to the hepatitis B guidelines that I mentioned are being updated, what you see here is what we had in 2015, as well as the new recommendation in 2020 for the use of antiviral prophylaxis with tenofovir as another adjunct measure to, um, uh, uh, to reduce mother-to-child transmission. And you see there on the left the algorithms. Um, and highlighted in red, were the areas that we prioritized for updating in these 2023 updated guidelines. So what were those key areas that we prioritized for update? Um, expanding the criteria for treatment, lowering the APRI score, lowering the HEPI DNA threshold, expanding the treatment, particularly for adolescents, the potential to use dual therapy, um, that's tenofovir with 3TC or FTC, because certainly in, uh, in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, that regimen, that combo regimen is much more available than single um, uh, tenofovir. Um, uh, the expanding the use of antiviral prophylaxis, the use of point of care viral load and reflex viral load just as for hepatitis C. And very importantly, and this has been flagged by several speakers, the, um, the, the Delta virus testing, the who to test and how to test and the use of reflex testing there. And finally, looking at good practice principles for promoting adherence, retention and care. And so these were the many reviews, um, <clears throat> modeling, systematic reviews, surveys of healthcare workers, surveys of the community, as well as landscaping of the diagnostics and um, the availability of dual therapy. It's a, a long and complex process, uh, um, uh, the WHO guidelines. Um, so what are the key messages? That the big focus will now be on who to treat rather than who not to treat. 
Um, and we're now including all age groups. And there will be an emphasis of including women of reproductive age, both pregnant and non-pregnant. And so this is really going to allow a common entry point for treatment to simplify implementation. And that many more pregnant and non-pregnant women will be on treatment for their own health, not just to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And this will really now capture almost 50% of all those hep B surface antigen positive and important will be applicable in all settings, both where there is access to HEP-B DNA and where there is not. Uh, and we, uh, we estimate that many HEP-B surface antigen will meet the criteria for treatment without the need for HEP-B DNA. And a big emphasis will be on the use of non-invasive tests um, and all those with uh, F2 or greater, um, which we know, you know, that treating that group has, is going to have the biggest impact on reducing liver cancers. And shown on the right was some um, an estimation by CDA and Homies group um, of uh, what proportion would meet the different eligibility criteria. This was just hypothetical scenarios that we were exploring. I think a really important message that coming out from the guidelines, and this was looking at service delivery, where um, we had far fewer studies than we had when we did the Hep C systematic review, that there are big gaps in the data capture on the later part of the cascade. We had quite a lot on testing uptake and linkage, <clears throat> but very little on what proportion of patients on tenofovir treatment are virally suppressed and what is their retention in care. But in those studies, we did have data on the adherence and retention in care um, was really very poor across the published literature. And that was both uh, um, in hospitals and primary care, but was particularly challenging in primary care. So I think going forward, we need to learn from the HIV experience and the critical need for ongoing adherence support and tracking and tracing those lost to care. So my final uh, slide or so is really charting Pakistan's path forward. I think we've heard uh, from all the previous presentations that everybody rec recognize the critical importance of a major scale up in testing and case finding with that systematic one-time testing of all adolescents and adults um, in both community and facility based, making use of the excellent infrastructure, the lady health workers um, and uh, community testing. I think time is of the essence and really the 67 million that were um, tested in Egypt, that was done over a very short period of, uh, of time. It was almost like a, a military style uh, response in terms of the coverage. And really that educate, profess, uh, prevent, test and treat approach with that strong emphasis on integrating the intervention, prevention integration uh, interventions. I think already in, uh, in, in Punjab and elsewhere, the adoption of uh, integrating Hep C and Hep B testing and treatment, that really is key. Um, um, uh, the two programs can run well alongside each other. And I think the importance of multi-partner and public-private engagement and the education and awareness raising. And it's terrific to hear that there's, uh, I think, uh, 550 million assigned to the awareness raising and education. Um, I think this is just to, to say that uh, the work that we did at an early stage in Egypt, that community-based educate, test and treat was really the inspiration for the initial formulation of the micro-elimination uh, initiative and project for Nankana Saab. Um, and this was that community mobilization, educational campaign, and that comprehensive testing and linkage to everyone aged 12 to 80 years. And um, these were really the results that really 92% um, took up the testing um, and um, that uh, almost all started treatment and very high rates of SVR cure. And what was really important also, that we did this across 73 different villages, was the more than 90% reduction in the incidence of new infections. Um, so really that almost immediate impact on um, um, 
um, on the incidents. And I think this has already been alluded to um, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Khan's presentation is really using micro elimination in villages or districts as the approach to achieving macro elimination. And I think the Nankana Saab um, findings mirror those that we uh, observed in Egypt. And this really is feasible and, uh, and practical. So I think that is my last slide. And um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Philippa, for such an awesome talk. As the day goes on, we keep learning and consolidating what has already been learned. And essentially, we learned a lot from the Egyptian model and your emphasis on decentralization and awareness, I think leaves a great key. And that might be the future towards a way of elimination. And very, I'm very grateful for your very kind update on hepatitis B as it is equally relevant with similar implications. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the session is open if you would like to ask any questions to Philippa. Uh, yeah, Philippa. So if it's possible for you to stay on uh, online, if it's not, you don't have any other pressing engagements because very soon we'll have like a, a, a wrap up session and I think your input would be greatly appreciated. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Philippa. Uh, I think we need to move on in view of time limitations. Uh, our uh, next uh, recorded uh, talk would be by Dr. Humi Razavi. I think he's a well-known word. Salam alaikum. Uh, My name is Homi Razavi with CDA Foundation. And it's an absolute. Uh, please, can you uh, record it? Talk. Let's stop. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to make a little change in our program. Uh, Honorable uh, Health Minister has uh, some commitments to leave relatively early. He does not require any introduction in Pakistan. He's been teacher of teachers, he's an academ academic, a clinician, a vice chancellor. And perhaps he's so popular, perhaps we might have to put his picture in our massive campaign again, viral hepatitis, as people might listen more to him than I'm not sure who. So it's my great pleasure to invite Professor Javed Akram to express his thoughts. Bismillah rahman rahim and assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, Usman, for uh, this introduction, of course, uh, for me, it's a family affair uh, with uh, Saeed Saab, uh, Saeed Akhtar Saab, and Faisal. Uh, we have very long memories, and that's the beauty of working in Pakistan, that we grow upon each other, and uh, we depend upon each other. Uh, I learned a lot while sitting there from Philippa's excellent talk on hepatitis B elimination. My apologies, as I am also social welfare minister, Bethel Mal, and so much uh, other things uh, on the agenda, as I have to rush to Governor House, uh, because Pakistan, I think, hardly ever features high in Olympics, but in Paralympics, Alhamdulillah, our Paralympian, they won 27 medal, and I am hosting them to Governor House on wheelchairs. So that is very, very important for me to be there. Thank you. Um, I think there are much wiser people sitting uh, um, uh, in my front and online. Uh, but I'll just say, Pakistan is a very, very different country altogether. My passion is to do research, medical research. And Alhamdulillah, I've done quite a bit of it and published it all over the world. Uh, I'll just quote two or three of my studies, which are eye openers for our visitors and for uh, others. We did a study when I was principal at Alama Iqbal Medical College and my co-author is sitting right there, Arif Siddiqui with me, if you remember. We looked at the skilled birth attendants. Uh, this was a DFID study, DFID funded. We pitched and we won the grant. So we went to all the districts of Punjab 
and we tried to find out how many of our females they have access to antenatal care by skilled birth attendant. Believe me, skilled birth attendant was only available to less than 23% of the females. So vast majority of our females get delivered by quacks. So that, 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 that does not happen even in Africa. So that is why we are one of those countries apart from Afghanistan who still is struggling to eliminate polio. So remember that it's not that easy a task. Then if you look at one of my studies, which I did of prevalence study of hepatitis in, in three main districts, that was Gujranwala, Gujarat and Sialkot. No, around 10% per population is positive for either of the viruses. But uh, there, 18% of the population was positive. And then when we looked at it, the dentists working there, out of those dentists, 30% were positive with the virus. If you look at hair cutting saloons, half of them were positive. Our 70% of circumcision is done by quacks. You know, they don't go to hospitals or anything. The tattooing, ear piercing, nose piercing. So I was discussing with Faisal, not Faisal Amir, but Faisal Dar. It's uh, because we have so many facets here. Uh, so anyhow, I was telling you, I said, the, what, what, what I was listening to was that uh, you are talking of supply problem. Okay, eliminate hepatitis through treatment, which is obviously one of the major pillars of elimination. So you interrupt the transmission chain. But I think in Pakistan, when we talk of evidence-based gu guidelines, we must first have the evidence to build up the guideline. There may be totally different approach required. So let's first build up on uh, or collect the evidence, whatever evidence is available in form of uh, RCTs or whatever uh, there, or meta-analysis. I have published recently a meta-analysis. So whatever the evidence is available, let's grade it and then develop locally evidence-based guidelines to eliminate hepatitis. Because I am not only looking at the supply side, but also we must curtail the demand. If people go for dialysis in Pakistan, you have about 50% chance of developing hepatitis B, C after three years of dialysis. So uh, our dial half of our dialysis nurses and paramedicals, they become positive. So I think that also needs very, very strong consideration. So my request to PKLI, which is our premier institute of which me as a Pakistani is, I'm very, very proud of, uh, is that they are entering a journey with lot of expectations with the hepatitis B elimination by 2030, which is very, very tough. I think we, do, we are a resource scarce country. We cannot afford to make the mistakes which others have made. Of course, it's good to learn from them, but then we must have our own data analyzed and also both demand and supply should be addressed to make it more efficient. And this model must have support of all the professional societies like I'm also president of, founding president of Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. So please involve a, a Pakistan Society of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, us, and let's make a task force. Uh, we have chapters, my Karachi head, Saeed Hamid is sitting there, my Lahore head is sitting there. So we have chapters even in villages, even in towns, and we have overseas chapters of Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. It is section 42 company of SECP. So please get them all together, leave nobody behind. Uh, and then unless we really cramp down on quackery, now this is the mandate of Healthcare Commission of Pakistan, which is my in, uh, organization. It is, uh, I, I look, at, look after that. So please involve that organization also. Unless you have clamped down on quackery and the circumcisions are done with sterile equipment, with all this, these kids, become just positive without 
and also we, we the vertical transmission that uh, was just uh, that that again and the healthcare providers themselves must be protected hepatitis b still the vaccination rate amongst hepatitis for hepatitis b prevention amongst healthcare providers providers is around 55%. So 45% are still healthcare providers that are to be vaccinated. So let's, let's, I think, look at the high risk groups first and let have our own indigenously developed guideline. <clears throat> and then we make sure we disseminate them, leaving no society behind, leaving no uh, nobody behind. And then obviously, um, uh, we can launch this program formally because 2030 is just 10 years, I mean, seven years from now. So it's a very hard task. So thank you so much once again for the invitation. It uh, has been a player and uh, I wish I could have spent more time, but uh, somehow um, because of the delayed uh, program here and my commitment, pre-commitments elsewhere, I'll, but uh, all of you, are a family to me and for my uh, guests visiting from abroad welcome once again and maybe your first visit but i'm sure not the last visit in hopefully we'll see each uh, much more of uh, you and you'll see much more of us because this is a herculean task that pkli has embarked upon but knowing pkli capability because it's not the brick and mortar, it's the people behind PKLI, which matters. And Alhamdulillah, we have the best leadership here. And I'm very, very positive that we'll be able to meet this target with, uh, I just them, want them to consider my humble suggestion, think global, but act local. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think uh, just one correction yes. that this is PKLA has initiated, but this is a Pakistan's project actually. So we are all together in this. This is just not uh, uh, very uh, briefly. Uh, uh, it is the time to appreciate and acknowledge uh, all those who uh, contributed towards this very exciting and successful event to acknowledge their hard work and commitment. Uh, I would like to request them to come up on the stage for their appreciation certificate from the Honorable Health Minister. Dr. Huma Qureshi, please come up. Dr. Imam Waqid from Egypt. Dr. Asghar Khan Jadun, KPK. Dr. Zulfakar Dariju, Sin. Dr. Shweb Kurd, Balochistan. Dr. Saeed Hamid. Dr. Usman Khalid, Mr. Usman Khalid Wahid. Ms. Elizabeth Murray. Saftar Pasha on behalf of Dr. Palita Mahipala, WHO. This is also the time to acknowledge all those who supported this educational uh, event. So I would uh, like to request the representative of Abbott Pakistan. Representative of Roche, Pakistan. Representative of Firo Sons Laboratories Limited.
representative of global marketing services representative of health capsules pakistan representative of uh, world health organization saftar pasha thank you very much mr chief uh, mr uh, health minister and we are grateful for our gracing the event uh, this afternoon sir marketing bhi dikhe eh? marketing bhi dikhe wo bandhe ka matlab chhe uh ladies and gentlemen uh, let's restart our program and my sincere apology to all our international uh, speakers and guests and invitees uh i think the next talk uh, we are going to restart is dr homi razavi uh, he is a well known international figure he has extensively published he has his work is primarily focus on impact of viral hepatitis D, uh, c and he has helped many countries in developing models to tackle burden and treatment strategies of viral hepatitis Assalamu alaikum. My name is Homi Razavi with CDA Foundation, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I want to thank Professor Navid and the organizers for the invitation to participate in this important meeting. Today, I'll be talking about cost of hepatitis C elimination and funding the elimination program. Now, as you all know, Pakistan has the world's largest population of people living with hepatitis C infection in the world. In fact, it, sur it surpasses China, India, and Russia in terms of the number of hep C infections. We estimate that every 20 minutes, a Pakistani dies of HCV-related complications. Now, if Pakistan doesn't take any action, Hepatitis C infections are expected to reach 11 million by 2030. We estimate today, they're estimated about 10 million and that's gonna to continue to increase if there's not an elimination program in place. But that's not all. In fact, there is associated with those statistics an increased number of deaths. So the graph that you see on the lower left shows the years of life lost due to premature death. So today we're estimating around 260,000 years of life is actually lost as a result of hep C infections. This is over the life of an uh, individual infected with hepatitis C. And that number is going to increase to almost 400,000 years of, uh, of life lost. But that's not all. People with hepatitis C also have high level of disability. If they have hepatocellular carcinoma or cirrhosis, they're less able to work. Um, they, of course, have to be hospitalized. And so today we estimate that about 23,000 years of disability are in Pakistan just as a result of hepatitis C infection. And that number is, going to, is expected to increase to 32,000. Now, all of this is very important to an economic analysis because we have to take into consideration what would be the overall cost of society if we don't do anything. Cumulatively, Pakistan has diagnosed about 30% of all EPSI infections in the country and treated about 16%. And this is really between 2017 and 2022 when DAAs became available. So we estimate about 3 million people have been diagnosed. That's almost out of almost 10 million. And then about 16% or 1.6 million have been treated. 
Now, today we estimate that there's about 22,000 um, new liver cancers annually. And of course, that number is expected to increase every year. And then that corresponds to about 25,000 deaths. Um, and that's as a result of not only hepatocellular carcinoma, but also cirrhosis. And that corresponds to about three deaths every hour. So every 20 minutes, we expect someone that's dying of hep C related complications in Pakistan. If we do achieve the elimination, the WHO elimination targets of diagnosing 90% and treating 80% of the population, we would avert 7 million total infections, 7.1 million. And that's a large number. And that's just in the next seven years. We would also avert about 1.5 million new infections, close to half a million cirrhotic cases, 92,000 liver cancer and 136,000 deaths. And that is the reason why we want to, why we want to pursue hepatitis elimination in Pakistan. So what do we need to do to achieve these targets? Well, we need to diagnose around 820,000 people uh, annually, but to diagnose that many, we need to screen almost uh, 4.5 million. And by 2030, we're gonna to have to screen about 9.8 million uh, people uh, annually. So why is that? As, as of course, as we screen more and more people, the, it's going to be more difficult to find people. Um, and so, in fact, we have to screen them additional people to be able to find the same number, 820,000 people, 830,000 people actually annually. Now, um, as they're diagnosed, and of course, we need to treat. The black line in the graphs above shows historically what we've done. So, uh, in fact, Pakistan has a great track record in 2018. Um, you had already as diagnosed close to 400,000. So we're really talking about really being expanding that program to uh, just double that program, essentially the size of that program. And uh, again, from in terms of the treatment up to the COVID pandemic, there was quite a few number of people being treated. And so what we need to do is to be able to link those patients to care and, and get them treated. So what does that mean in terms of cost? If now, it's important to realize that there is a cost associated with elimination, but there's also a large cost associated with not doing anything. So if Pakistan doesn't adopt hepatitis C elimination, it will continue to spend on healthcare cost, and that's the majority of the cost. So that's the graph on the upper left, the blue, and those are the healthcare costs. So, you know, we're going to have people that have to go to hospital for their advanced liver disease, um, hepatocellular carcinoma, as well as cirrhosis. Um, now, you can see the green, but that would be under the base scenario, how much we would spend on screening, which is fairly minimal, and red is what we would spend on uh, on treatment. Again, that's fairly minimal if that's just essentially following the status quo strategy. So we would spend approximately 70 million um, and going forward that that goes down to about 55 million annually, actually. And the reason that the expenses goes down is because people are dying, unfortunately. Um, so we were actually what's this this analysis doesn't take into consideration is the uh, is the, the life's loss. And I'll show you in a minute um, how, how we take that into consideration. So these are just direct costs. These are out of pocket, what the government would have to pay in terms of healthcare, screening and, and lab costs. And today the patients are paying for the majority of that. So take a look at the graph on the, on the lower left. Now, if we adopt an elimination program, we will have to pay uh, more for screening. And now you see those green bars are actually larger. And of course, treatment. And those are the red bars and, and lab cost. Uh, so the majority, a significant portion of this is actually cost of PCR, because as we know, the cost of DAAs in Pakistan are actually the lowest in the world. So this is assuming that we don't negotiate the cost of PCR. So it does, initially, we do have to spend about 120 million, but one of the things you notice on this particular graph is pretty quickly, once you achieve the elimination target, the overall cost of the program actually will decrease. And in fact, by 2030, it will be below what you would have spent 
under the uh, no action scenario, or if he didn't do anything, actually. So under the prime minister's plan, Pakistan will spend more up front for hepatitis C elimination, but by 2026, the overall annual cost would be less than what we would have spent doing nothing. Now, the blue, of course, is the healthcare cost, but the, really the cost of elimination program is shown in the lower right corner, which is what's the budget required to screen for lab tests and treatment. And that's approximately a little bit more than 60 million annually. And that drops significantly after we achieve the elimination by 2027. In fact, the elimination doesn't, complete elimination doesn't occur by 2030, but you see a fairly large drop after 2027. Now, I said that these are only looking at direct medical costs, uh, what we have to spend, but we're not taking into consideration uh, shorter life expectancy and disability. And that's captured in DALI. So DALI's are disability adjusted life years averted. And uh, what we're shown here is the same cost that you saw in the previous graph, but it's those costs divided by how many DALI's we avert by achieving elimination. So we're reducing disability and there will be fewer deaths. Um, so in, in fact, we avert all those. And as a matter of principle, if you have cost per DALI averted below one GDP or one gross national income per capita, which in Pakistan is around um, 1,280, which is the dotted line that you see in the upper left, then that intervention is considered highly cost effective. In fact, what this graph shows is that even starting in 2023 and 2004, elimination of hepatitis C in Pakistan is highly cost effective. Now, one of the things that you see in this graph is by actually by 2037, you see the actually the, the cost per DALI averted goes below uh, the, uh, the X axis. And what that means is, in fact, it's cost saving at that point, which is now we're actually, by eliminating hepatitis C in Pakistan, we're actually saving money. Now, it's important to highlight is when I'm showing these costs per daily averted, that is only using existing screening, PCR, and treatment costs. Um, and so, in fact, if those, uh, with the national program actually being implemented, if those prices are negotiated, you will achieve cost saving even earlier. Now, another way of looking at the, the same data is to look at the graph on the lower left. The black line shows the cumulative direct medical costs. So this is screening, laboratory test, um, as well as uh, a treatment and hospitalization from 2022 moving forward if we don't do anything. So if we don't do anything by uh, essentially by 2040, we would have spent um, essentially a billion dollar um, on just uh, the direct medical cost. Now the green line shows the cumulative direct medical cost under the WHO elimination scenario. Again, this stresses the same thing, which is we are going to spend a little more upfront. But look, after 2037, in fact, we start spending less than we would have otherwise by doing nothing. So this is very, very encouraging and very exciting because it allows Pakistan to eliminate one of the largest disease burdens in the world. And in fact, from a healthcare perspective, save money. In conclusion, Pakistan has the world's largest population of people living with HCV infections. And if the country doesn't take any action, HCV infections are expected to reach 11 million people by 2035. If we don't do anything, the burden of HCV is expected to continue to increase over time. However, Elimination of Hep C in Pakistan will avert 1.5 million new HCV infections, 136,000 deaths, almost 500,000 new serotic cases, and 92,000 uh, battery carcinoma cases.
as the, the study suggested, HCV elimination will cost more at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of the program for screening, lab test, and treatment. But we see those costs actually coming down once elimination has been achieved. What's important to know is that by all economic measures, HCV elimination in Pakistan is highly cost effective starting today. And what's better is that elimination of HCV is cost saving as we move forward. Actually by 2037 with today's prices, but as those prices are negotiated, especially for PCR testing, in fact, the cost saving, the year that cost saving targets will be achieved will even move up earlier. I want to congratulate Pakistan for implementing the Prime Minister's Elimination Program. This is incredible achievement for this program to start, for the government, the national government, to fund the Elimination Program, and for the provinces to actually match that funding. I believe this is something that we will be talking to our grandchildren and their children about in 2003, how we were in this meeting and the prime minister's plan was announced and uh, Pakistan started its path toward the elimination of hepatitis. It is such an honor to be here and have take part in this meeting. And I look forward to continuing seeing your progress toward hepatitis C elimination. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we are grateful for a, such a wonderful uh, talk, comprehensively analyzing the impact of hepatitis C virus on the socioeconomic landscape of Pakistan if appropriate measures are not adopted. And we are looking forward to incorporate all the recommendations in our future strategy to tackle this uh, challenge. Uh, I think we need to move on swiftly and we will leave some time to wrap up and uh, for question answers at the uh, end of the next talk. Now it's my uh, pleasure to invite uh, Executive Director at the Gilead Sciences, Elizabeth Murray. We do understand this is a complex uh, uh, war against uh, preventable diseases. Diagnostic modalities, understanding, implementation of infrastructure, these are all issues which we need to address, but it is equally important how to provide cost-effective, e easy, safe, and cheap medication uh, to the doorstep of the population. So it is my uh, pleasure to request Elizabeth to come on the stage for your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think I'm the last person, so it's between me and everybody going home. So I appreciate, well, I think a wrap up. It's not often um, that pharmaceutical company gets to follow cost effectiveness and <laughs> uh, not get booed off the stage. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, I hope everybody noticed slide number six of Homi. Um, uh, Pakistan has the least expensive um, hepatitis C DAAs uh, in the world are available here. So um, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased uh, that we're able to make that available. We don't like to use the word cheap. We like to use the word high quality, cost effective um, volume medicines um, for patients. So, oh, where's my clicker? All right, um, I've gone through the slides a couple of times to try and shorten them as we were uh, running late on the presentation. So here we go. I'm gonna focus on voluntary licensing. Um, I manage Gilead's voluntary licensing. Uh, we have three of them, um, one for HIV, uh, one for um, viral hepatitis, um, uh, C and B, and then more recently, uh, COVID-19. Uh-oh. I should have been paying attention. Okay. Um, I work for the division called Global Patient Solutions. We currently um, are responsible for 96 countries, primarily uh, low and low middle income countries. Uh, although our voluntary licenses um, uh, correlate to a different uh, set of countries, uh, more than 96. Um, more than 65% of the uh, generic remdesivir, which is the more recent of the voluntary licenses for COVID-19, 
um, uh, made uh, um, remdesivir available in the LMICs, low middle income countries. The highest number of people living with um, viral chronic hepatitis is in our region and more than 85% of people newly infected with HIV uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa are girls. Where we work, four continents, the 96 countries, um, 4 billion people. And I think you can see very large and diverse populations, the highest burden of HIV, including highly treatment experience um, individuals, um, approximately 39 million. Hepatitis is a very hidden problem. We've heard it all throughout today. No need for me to uh, continue going there. Approximately 300 million people um, and more than 58 million with hepatitis C. And then we also have a medication, not through voluntary license, um, but for uh, invasive fungal infections known as um, ambisome. Our aspirations are to end, the epi end epidemics. Voluntary licensing and access. So what is voluntary licensing? The focus of voluntary licensing is to enable equitable access um, through voluntary licensing. And we've got almost 20 years of experience with generic manufacturers. And we transfer uh, the rights to our intellectual property to trusted partners um, that we know have the capability to manufacture the medicines to the standards that we want our patients, um, well, your patients, to have of these medicines. And um, we establish these partnerships. We work closely with those uh, generic manufacturers. Uh, we do technology transfers, and we share that commitment to deliver uh, access to the medicines. And that engagement continues. We share best practices. They improve. Uh, systems for manufacturing um, uh, faster, shortening times. They share that with us and we share with them. Sometimes, um, depending on the situation, like with COVID, uh, there was a shortage of some of the raw materials and we were able to help um, our generic manufacturers um, acquire some of those materials. Uh, some of our partners um, the needed we needed medicines fast, right? Nobody expected COVID. So we uh, supported with donations of API right here in Pakistan, as a matter of fact. Um, we provide the technology transfer. We support access through these licenses. So our HCV voluntary license is 105 countries. Our HIV is 116. And COVID-19 was 127 um, countries. Our licensees set their own prices. Um, the idea is that they compete with uh, themselves. We don't tell them uh, where to set the prices. It's up to them. And um, they pay nominal royalties or they don't pay a royalty at all. For COVID-19, uh, we never collected uh, a royalty payment and allowed them to reinvest uh, that money um, that they needed to uh, ramp up very quickly and invest at risk, by the way, um, because we only had an emergency use uh, FDA approval. So um, Gilead was investing at risk, but our generic manufacturers were also investing at risk. We are pioneers in the voluntary licensing world. Gilead was, uh, was the first pharmaceutical company um, to start voluntary licensing with HIV and access programs. In fact, back in 2000, Six and you heard many times the story of um, Egypt, um, and we had the um, voluntary license for hepatitis C in Egypt and in 2014, uh, and then it expanded uh, quite quickly. Um, we've supported through donations to help um, manufacturers scale up as it was um, needed, and then similarly um, in 2020 for COVID-19. COVID-19 uh, was March 2020 when uh, the announcement was made, uh, World Health Organization, and we had um, nine agreements um, executed by May 22nd of 2020. One here in Pakistan, uh, Ferozan's our partner, um, one in Egypt, and um, uh, the seven in India. Uh, by the end of 2020, we had already made more than 1.7 million um, treatments available. And by the close of last year, 8.1 million uh, treatments were made available um, to
to patients around the world. If you follow the data, we saved the lives of more than 4 million people um, during the height of the pandemic. For that, we won um, the Patents uh, for Humanity from the US Patent and Trademark Office. This is a, a huge recognition um, for the work um, for two reasons. One, for sharing responsible use of our IP and sharing IP with generic manufacturers. But the other reason is because of our effective access strategy. Had we just shared the um, IP with generic manufacturers and not really made anything happen, I'm sure we wouldn't have won the award, but we did um, more than 8.1 million um, patients were able to uh, successfully receive uh, remdesivir in the height of um, the pandemic. And we certainly supported during some very significant um, surges around the world. Partnerships, that's the second part of this presentation. Um, you can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. I think we've heard it um, throughout um, today's presentations and yesterday's as well. And for us, um, partnerships start with science. Um, the reason we were able, this is just the remdesivir story, but it's true for all of our uh, partnerships. Um, the remdesivir story and the reason we were able to be successful with remdesivir um, for a pandemic that uh, I think arguably nobody expected um, was because we had already been conducting science um, on this uh, with this molecule since 2009, and we uh, our scientists um, saw promise in coronaviruses, and we already had safety data. Had we not already been um, conducting science and uh, trials and had safety data, we would not have been able to make it. Um, to market and into humans so quickly. So the science is very important. Companies like Gilead and other pharmaceutical companies that invest in R&D are um, critical uh, to uh, bringing medicines um, to save lives. And so fortunately, uh, we were the company um, and I was able to experience that. Um, and it was very exciting times, honestly, very painful and very sad. Um, but exciting from the perspective of being able to um, help people uh, in a time of desperate um, need. These are just a few programs um, of demonstrating partnerships. And again, um, because we're running uh, low on time, um, but you know, visceral leishmaniasis is uh, endemic in some uh, very poor parts of the world and our medicine uh, ambisome uh, is truly life-saving. And through a program we have with the WHO, uh, we train healthcare workers, uh, more than 2,000 across 28 countries. And we've really been able to um, save the lives of uh, many, many uh, thousands of people and primarily children in very poor uh, parts of the world. Um, Mobile Health Wallets is a very interesting program in collaboration uh, with NGOs that have connected more than 900 patients in this particular uh, pilot to 450 clinics. And this is something that might even work in some rural parts of, of um, Pakistan as you're thinking about rolling out uh, some of the programs uh, for hepatitis C. Um, the last one on that previous screen, if it goes back to that, uh, is a Pakistan one. There we go, digital humanitarian aid to end hepatitis C in Pakistan. And this was actually featured at this year's um, European um, Liver Conference. Gilead collaborated with MasterCard and the World Hepatitis Alliance for Rosens and local NGOs to tackle the hepatitis C um, epidemic in Pakistan through a donation of medicines and local manufacturing. And then the last one, microelimination project in Georgia, you heard from John Ward, the prison program here in Pakistan that you've heard of as well. And then um, too much we've heard, to, well, not too much, a lot we've heard today on the success of, of Egypt. Um, and that's all I have to share today. I hope it was interesting. We've heard a lot of key learnings. There you go. That's right. um, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, ladies and gentlemen. We had a very extensive and busy day, and I can understand the, we are just touching the last moments. I think this is really important that we 
wrap up the things we have gone through during the course of the day to formulate our future strategy with some realistic and uh, uh, optimistic recommendations, which might be very helpful in reshaping our program for elimination of viral hepatitis. So for this uh, wrap-up session, our international speakers, Elizabeth, uh, Philippa Easterbrook, I believe is on a line. And I would request Imam Wakid from Egypt, please come on the stage. Dr. Huma Qureshi and Dr. Said Hamid. And Elizabeth Murray, I would also request to please join uh, the panel as well. And it is my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Said Akhtar to come here on the desk to wrap up the session for future ambitions and planning. Uh, thank you very much. And I know it's been a very, very long day, but I think it's time to wrap it up. And uh, since we have already laid the, the foundation, I don't want to leave this undocumented. Uh, Faisal, I'll be the, uh, I want Faisal to stay here. Um, uh, so I, uh, so we are going to wrap it up, but I don't. I want to make it a very useful day, so that whatever we have said so far, we want to document it, put it on a document, uh, run by all of the experts, and then maybe submit it to the government and say, this is what we think is, is the future actually. So question. Uh, so uh, now, uh, uh, should we look there? So the so the, the consensus is should we target only above eighteen? I think the data suggests that we should only target about eighteen. So. Uh, so should we look for hepatitis B simultaneously? Because it's, a, it's a major effort. Gee, and, and we don't have the means to then right. link them up to treatment, to everybody to treatment. That right. is the problem. So, so you're saying that even if you make the diagnosis, that, that there's nothing we can do over them? There's nothing. We so can instead of anything. diluting our effort, just focus on hep C. Imam, uh, Dr. Bakir. Uh, in Egypt, we didn't we didn't test for hepatitis B. Okay. Uh, maybe because hepatitis B is a much lower problem in Egypt than in Pakistan, but uh, for logistic reasons, we focused on hepatitis C only. Right. So that that's. Then the ethical issues will start. Once you identify them and do nothing about them, Amara, then the ethical issues will start. So I think we, we probably have to come up with another plan. So let me tackle C and then just go from there. Okay. We should stress on the birth dose, the hepatitis B birth Correct. dose. That Agreed. is a single So um, Faisal made the documentation, birth dose vaccination. Uh, so we have already spoken to the, uh, the minister and I think provinces will be on board because this was my major concern. The provinces have already raised their concerns. And I think whenever we have our next meeting, we will let the, the minister know or the ministry know that you know, there are concerns and we should, federation should act as, as a father instead of just saying, if you want to bring the matching grant, fine. Otherwise just, just go away. I don't think that's the right approach. We, we need to enable them. We need to um, give them the resources, we need to strengthen them. We can technologically strengthen them. We can, if, if possible, through HR strengthening, et cetera, et cetera, sharing EMR with them, kind of a strengthening. So, yes, I, I fully agree with you, but, you know, talking with the provinces, you know, like they have already made their budgets. June has gone, so they have already submitted their budget. So this year, they can't raise it. Okay. So, so I think, and we can't stop for a year. So, so I think we have to let the prime minister know and the planning minister know that for the first year, this, this, this whatever we procure, they should go to them so that they continue the, the ball rolling. Right. And maybe next year grant, they can, they can use their own resources and, and increase the grant. Uh but we have to just right. move it. I personally feel by the time this whole thing gets launched, by the time the paperwork, the whole thing, the, the amount that the provinces have already shown in their own budgets is, is more than it's enough. Adequate. It's, it's, it's adequate. adequate. So I don't think that should be yeah. an issue. Yes. But for, from next year, I think as a matter of principle, we need to tell them that we need yeah. to take the, all the provinces on board. Just one thing. The, the key word should be some flexibility. Flexibility. At least in the first year of, of the program. 
So, it, and I think we all agree that it, it needs to be do, done simultaneously as a surgical strike throughout the entire country. So, the reservoir is very big. So, we have gone through that. Most effective. So, now, now the, the, and this is a very big key here. The, so, what's the most efficient way of doing uh, the diagnosis? Is it do the antibody test, reflex testing, and then sending the labs? But as we heard about decentralization concept, what about the POC and where do we send with that? I'm talking POC RNA. So, you know, like the reflex test will not only save you time, but also cost because the, the person who's doing the rapid test will straight away take up the virus sample. The patient does not move. Right. The sample goes to the lab. And then once the results come, the treatment can be started. No, but you're saying that the samples still have to go to the lab. What I'm saying is if we do, and we try to do that in our PKI clinics through Sefian's uh, 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 next gene uh, expert method, but that was too expensive. Yeah, the gene expert is yes. expensive, so so you know, and and we can't afford that. Right. So so I think we still. What about have to the go newer uh, POCs for RNA? Get ready. So uh, the, for the start of the program, we will have to depend on okay. what we currently. Do. So so the recommendation is, get the sample. Um, and reflex if, test if if so no the finger stick first if yeah. positive get the blood sample yeah. and then let them go home there is that the yes yes okay absolutely absolutely we can we can we can give you that data nobody is positive after five minutes right POC what's the best POC for antibody and and what what is the POC are we talking about uh, SD bioline or or is it or a quake or what, what, what do you recommend? A, the bottom line should be a WHO pre-qualified test. Like give some names so that we can jot them down. So SD Bioline is is one of them. There are there are other there are two. Or a quick or a sure. Or a quick or a sure are are are, are, are they have hundred percent sensitivity and specificity, but they're very expensive. They're very expensive. They're very expensive. Yes, please, uh, Flipa, go ahead. my <laughs> program. Thanks. Um, thanks very much. I just really wanted to just make a few quick comments, if I, if I may. Um, the 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 question about the hepatitis B testing and your response that uh, maybe to focus primarily on hepatitis C. Um, maybe I missed some earlier presentations on this, but I would just sort of question that. I mean, you have a very low cost drug, tenofovir, $30 a year. I'm not quite sure what the, the rates are in Pakistan. Chai's just negotiated also a new deal on this. And so, um, and it seemed to have been in certainly some of the clinics I visited, the vaccination was working well uh, for those who were negative. So what would be the issues with integrating hepatitis B, uh, and given that the, the contribution to liver cancers and uh, mortality are greater. Philippa, if I may answer that, the, the programs currently, the government programs currently offer only one year of treatment. And that is probably what they will continue to do. Unless we can find mechanisms of sustaining that treatment, which we know is in some cases is lifelong, it 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 becomes a difficult task to handle that. I I, I get your point about the vaccination. Uh, if people are negative, they can be vaccinated. I think that's a that's a, a important step. That is happening. Uh, vaccination uh, rates for even catch up vaccination are very good in our country uh, in in almost all the programs. Uh, so. That's why we hesitate. And I, and I think the comment was made earlier that at least we need to get this program off the ground and then we can continue to build on it. For example, in the, in the later part of the program, Egyptians start, started to test their blood sugars and, and, uh, and uh, blood pressures and so on and so forth. So I think if we take this a little bit step by step, that might make it a, a more palatable and more uh, easily implementable. I, I think if I may, uh, we want to make a recommendation to the government that once the program rolls over and it starts to work, maybe a year or two down the road, we can convince the, the officials that, you know, it's worth putting the money for Hep B as well because of the morbidity and the mortality. That can, I, can I add one, one Please. comment? 
deciding treatment for hepatitis C is very easy. Right. And you can teach the GPs and the nurses to the, the prescribe hepatitis C treatment. Hepatitis B treatment decision is more complex and it needs a specialist to, to decide that the patient needs treatment and for how long. Sure. Okay. Great. Next slide, please. Is it, was that a question to me? <laughs> no, 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 that was no, a comment. Sorry, sorry. Next, next, okay. uh, change the slide. Please. Thanks. Next slide, please. Are you chilling? Ne next slide, please. Next. Next. So we have decided that uh, we are not for P POC for RNA at this point in time because there's no reliable other than if, unless we can negotiate some good deal uh, with the uh, gene expert. And so, if I so could just <clears throat> add a comment on that, I mean, I, I do think it's helpful to, um, I guess, think strategically about where the point of care RNA may be uh, most useful, be it a hard to reach uh, settings, rural settings. Um, and I, I, I think to explore whether strategic placement uh, and at harm reduction drug treatment programs, uh, it would certainly be uh, that was where the evidence base was the strongest, because that's where the attrition in that population is greatest. And again, there's been uh, some great deals now with Chai and others where uh, they are down to eight dollars for a viral load. Uh, I'm not sure how that compares in Pakistan with the uh, centralized lab based um, and unfortunately, even though we did quite a bit of work with Fine to really promote um, and sponsor new manufacturers to be developing the point of care um, uh, uh, antigen, core antigen test, that that proved to have very low sensitivity. So as yet, there is no... Um, it doesn't look as though that will be forthcoming in the uh, the near future. Right. And I think uh, one other question that remains is, if, if the group agrees, that if we are talking about the PCR versus the core antigen, whatever is cheaper is, is a way to go. Is, is that the right understanding? Okay. So they, uh, I want to put that down. So now uh, we have talked about sampling. So the question was that we did, we did the finger stick, the guy was positive, so then why not go with the dry blood spot because there's a hell of, hell of a data that you can do the PCRs with them and then you can save them for your research. And we, in our experience, when we were trying to bring uh, material from uh, our, our all the peripheral clinics, we had a lot of problem with refrigeration and the samples to be transported and whatnot. So it can be done, but I think there's a very clear, big body of data about dry, dry blood spot and then doing PCRs through so those blood, dry blood spots. Yeah, so so uh, you are right that you know using a DBS can make things easy, uh, but but currently the expertise to extract the sample uh, the, the 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 serum, the, serum uh, the virus for DBS for HCV uh, or is is kind of non-existent. Uh, we no, nobody in the local scenario has checked it, uh, but. It, it, it would be worth exploring. But the other option which is available is the plasma suppression card, which is available, uh, though not uh, currently it's available, but it's not like being used as, 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 as a free will, but it's available. You can just put in the few drops of- So a uh, couple of pilots can be run yeah, on yeah. DBS and uh, yeah, plasma yeah. suppression card. It's the pilot has already been run and yeah. it's been found to be very, very- No, it's, in our setup. Yeah, in our setup, right, yeah, right. Yeah. okay. The paper is currently in the, in the print. Okay. So it's been run, but that's an option that's available. So then we all agree about minimizing the testing and punctures. Uh, we we have agreed on most efficient way of linking that as soon as the PCR comes back, you know, 
how how we drop drop the 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 dropout rate that is mainly massive education okay. that is massive education so the campaign i think is the name of the game a massive campaign and and the best meds we have already agreed that it's a soft deck or soft well whatever is uh, efficacy wise they are about the same and uh, pen to both pen genotypic so whatever is cheaper yeah. and then we have gilead sitting here so depending yeah. on how, what kind of a discount we can get from them okay um, and the, the cost of the efficient way of delivery i think that's very important do we deliver them at home did you guys do that in in egypt no no uh, the patients uh, came to get their medication and they got the three months up front and they got a three months up front the whole medication the whole medication up front and they got a voucher to come back for the SVR testing at after six months. Okay. And they were not recalled during treatment or uh, before the SVR test. Okay. So uh, I know that um, uh, I think the primary and uh, uh, hepatitis program, they ran this pilot about uh, delivering the medications at home. Uh, is there anybody from pri uh, primary healthcare here? They, they they use these uh, yeah, services, the courier services, the courier services yeah, too. But but I think say uh, to 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 have the uh, patients' confidence over the healthcare systems, we have recommended in 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 the in the PC one is that the primary care physician because we don't want the patient to move, we want them to be at the RHC or the BHU wherever they are. So we take the rapid test, we send the blood, the blood reports come back to the primary care physician uh, or a nurse or, who, or a lady health worker, and then we dispense the treatment there. And, 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 and the patient gets treatment from there. I was just thinking of saving a trip of the patient to the, the doctor. It's close to the house. It's a RHC. So it's hardly, it's I think, not even half a mile. And then follow-up SVR, we must do yeah. that as a scientist. We, we must do the follow-up SVR. Uh, next slide. Next. And can, I I ask, uh, can I ask, I, do we need a follow-up as we are with the 98% cure rate? Can we do it? I know you it? have a different opinion, but go ahead, please. No, no, I mean... So uh, what's, what's your... And Philippa, I would, would require your comment on that. When a medication has 98% response rate, why do we need a follow-up SVR? I think, as you say, this has been debated quite a lot. And I know at one stage, MSF stopped doing that in their, their, their various programs. I do think, though, there, there are we've seen issues in some countries where there are mixed genotypes, where perhaps the uh, staging to identify those with cirrhosis who need longer courses of treatment and where it's not being recognized and there's under treatment. And we've seen some countries, for example, Myanmar, where it was only 82 percent. So um, and the reasons for that uh, are not, not always clear, but unrecognized cirrhosis uh, is is a potential contributing uh, cause. I think if you've got a high burden, and even if you just have 92 percent, 95 percent cure rate, that can uh, account for a significant uh, proportion uh, or number, absolute number of people who've uh, uh, sort of not been cured. Uh, so I, I think I think where that can be done efficiently and i do think we can consider also using gbs for this as well and i just wanted to mention that there are now manufacturers protocols from abbott in the last 2022 hep c guidelines we added what was missing before from our recommendations because we recommended dbs for serology and virology we were missing manufacturers protocols abbott now has that and of course there's the plasma separation card so my, can I make a recommendation that, say, for example, we work for first two years or three years and look at our pool data. And then if we think that our SVR is 98%, 99%, even 95% for all the epidemiological work, uh, then we should stop doing it because we are saving costs which that can be utilized somewhere else. Well, those are the insufficiencies. Number one, we know that 50% or less people will turn up for an SVR, and that's fine. That is a that there is already a representative sample that is coming to right. you. This is positive reinforcement, both for the patient, the community, and for the program. Right. So I would certainly no, no question. I mean, I would want to do it actually, yeah. but uh, anyway. Okay. So yes. 
So we'll do that here. Prevent. Next slide, please. So augmenting all this, there's no question, and I think make a recommendation. Now, do we have a healthcare commission in Sindh? And is it an active healthcare commission? What about Balochistan and uh, KPK? In all provinces. Uh, so I think in next meeting, we need to call all the healthcare commissions to the meeting, their heads, so that all these things which would lead to reinfection, I think, so like your slide, we are pouring water in the bucket. Right. So micro of the uh, of the pockets that we have, I think we have agreed research opportunities, clinical trials, development of ineffective surveillance. I think this is a very important message down the, the last slide that this whole exercise will give us uh, a, 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 an avenue to develop a very effective surveillance mechanism for the years to come. So we not only talk about hepatitis C, but a lot of other communicable diseases. So we, we would make a very strong recommendation that we need to create a system like CDC in the United States, where they have a very robust mechanism of a surveillance so that uh, uh, I think out of this, some good will come out. Next slide, please. Can I just make one additional suggestion in the surveillance system, which is uh, as this starts to roll out, um, I think doing at Sentinel sites, the monitoring of incidents by retesting those who test negative um, in a year, um, you can uh, have a very good capture of uh, how well transmission is being controlled. That will be a big motivator for the government if you see these spectacular declines in um, incidents um, to really uh, continue to galvanize the program. So I think that would be a good addition to the surveillance. Great. So funding opportunities, we agree that once we have something to show them, and uh, Dr. Saeed Hamid was mentioning about some meeting in February, uh, I thought it may be a little bit earlier to start such a giant program and show them. But even if we can show them that this is a giant program that we are starting, that should be a good motivation for the international donors to come up. Yeah. And then we again work on local entrepreneurs uh, and, and the, the industry owners, businessmen. I think there should be a policy matter from the, the government that everybody who has an employee, the employer should be responsible for their hep C uh, diagnosis and treatment. Next. So what should be the plan of execution? So this is the plan of execution that we have just discussed. Uh, we should create something like a central NCOC tag, one mid of procurement. And I think that's a very important take home message. I think we should recommend from this forum that instead of everybody buying uh, two pounds of their own medication, it should be a central procurement mechanism with a distribution and diagnostics. Surveillance relapse and drugs. I think we we have covered it all. I, I think this was a very productive day as far as I'm concerned, that we have something that we we uh, can. Right. So well, yeah, so the software, jot down the we need to create a, a single software applicable for to from the for the whole country and also a very organized, centralized, as well as decentralized campaign uh, against uh, uh, yesterday, Prime Minister was making fun of me. He said, you know, like Egypt, when he was talking to me privately, he said, <laughs> with, with that, like Egypt, they're going to call some dancers and we'll make you the chief guest. <laughs> I said, Osman would be the most suitable chief guest <laughs> for that kind of occasion. So anyway, so, uh, well, so I think this is, uh, I'm very grateful to all of you for being here for a very long day. But this has been a very productive day. I, at this point in time, I want to thank everybody, people who travel, Dr. Imam Bakid, uh, Saeed, Dr. Huma, and everybody else uh, who has traveled a uh, long distance, uh, Liz. And, uh, and I want to thank Philippa. We could not see you here, but maybe next there will be a next time, not too, not too far from today. And I think we should just reconvene again in the next couple of months and uh, have another uh, session. I want to thank everybody, and uh, we will be giving some shields to people who have really worked hard to. Uh, right, okay. So, uh, Usman will close this uh, and then we take it. Uh, but I want to thank from my side as a person, thanks for be being here with us today. Thank you.
Uh, may I request the representative of Dr. Balita Mahipala, WHO representative? Uh, I think they have a recorded message for closing remarks of the day. They could understand because of the, some commitments. So can we please uh, play the message? Um, I think uh, time is limited, so I think I would like to request the Dean of the PKLI to please come on the stage and say a word of thanks. Uh, thank you very much all for such a long day. Uh, it was very eventful uh, due to my transparent commitment. I missed the second session, but otherwise, I think uh, the whole day has made us very wiser how to take the hepatitis uh, C elimination strategy uh, forward. Uh, but as a transplant surgeon, I see the end spectrum of uh, hepatitis. And when we started uh, developing liver transplant programs uh, in 2011, uh, I used to have a Dr. Huma Qureshi's paper from PMRC. Uh, and according to that paper in 2007, about seven to eight percent of the Pakistani population was infected with uh, hepatitis B and C combined. Uh, Five percent to be precise for hepatitis C and 2.5 percent for hepatitis B. And I used to build models to extrapolate the need of liver transplantation in our country. Uh, Although we have done uh, more than 2,000 liver transplants in the last 10 years in this country, we have 10 liver transplant centers. But working on PKLI's financial support model for poor patients transplant, um, I recently wrote this paper uh, for the policymakers uh, to tell them the need of a liver transplantation in this country. So looking at all the figures and the numbers presented today, uh, with Pakistan having nearly 10 million people affected with viral hepatitis. And around 35 per million is the need of a liver transplantation in our country. And now in the recent census, Pakistan has a population of 250 million. Uh, we ranked 154 in the uh, global human index. Uh, we have a $340 billion uh, GDP, and our per capita income is unfortunately $1,537, probably one of the lowest in the country. And we have the highest population of hepatitis C in the world. So with these numbers, uh, we need at least 7,000 liver transplants annually in our country. And although we offer the cheapest or the most cost-effective liver transplantation in our country, uh, to support 7,000 liver transplantations, we do need 28 billion rupees annually in this country. And I was going through, Dr. Uh, uh, I think some of the slides that Pakistan need $350 million to eradicate just hepatitis C from this country. But actually, based on that, if we want to eradicate 10 million people, we need at least 100 billion rupees to eradicate hepatitis C. And for transplantation, you need 28 billion annually. So we can imagine the amount of money we are going to spend. I don't think so it will be 1.5% of our GDP. I haven't got actually the mathematics at this moment, but I think it will be certainly more than that. So this day, I think beautifully highlighted the need of starting the hepatitis elimination campaign on urgent basis. But unfortunately, uh, on one side, uh, uh, the prime minister has launched the national campaign, but unfortunately, this government is going to go away a day after tomorrow. So we don't know what happened next, but we remain hopeful that with government at least putting 35 billion, uh, and if the policy of uh, national campaign continues, we should be able to get this program up and running. All we need to do is work cohesively uh, from the 
central government along with all the provinces and all the major institutions and professionals need to come together to take this menace on. So I, at the end, I would like to thank everyone who have come from different parts of the country, from abroad to grace our occasion and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dar. Can we quickly play the uh, message, please, if we can? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, soon after, I think we uh, are closing the ceremony. Uh, it is a time to appreciate for those who did a very hard and committed work for weeks and perhaps over a month uh, to enable this very successful event, uh, which we thoroughly enjoyed. We learned a lot to take on further. So this is the I would like to request uh, uh, Chairman Board of Governors, Dr. Say Doctor, and the Dean, Dr. Faisal Dar, to come up and acknowledge the hard work and the commitment and the work done by the team at PKR Life. And I would also like to request uh, Imam Wakid to please come up and honor uh, the team at PKR Life. So I would like to uh, request uh, from Administration Department General Manager, Mr. Zulfkar, to please come on the stage for appreciation award. I would like to request GM Marketing, Mr. Tarek Zaman, to come over, please. And very importantly, from the facilities management department, I would like to request Colonel Afzal to please come over to receive your appreciation award. That, that's, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I think these are the names I hold. Closing. Uh, uh, finally, thank you. Sir, I don't have the list at the moment, sir. We can have a certain sheets for the marketing team. Uh, so I don't have that. Yes, okay. Uh, so uh, please come over. Uh, Shahid, Mr. Shahid Saab from marketing. Mudassar Riaz, Mudassar Mujtaba, Shafiq Zafar, Shafiq Zafar Saha, Mr. Tazeen Ahmed, Mr. Hamad Khalid, Hafiz Fawad, Sara Hafiz, Muhammad Zaheen, Makdoum Malik, Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big hand at the last but not the least, Osama
No one else? Okay. Thank you. Hmm? Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind time. And I think lastly, we will run the message of Dr. Palita from WHO. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting us to join the campaign for Hepatitis Pre Pakistan. I extend my deep appreciation for Punjab Liver and Kidney Institute, especially Dr. Saeed Akhtar, for organizing this scientific session on reviving the National Viral Hepatitis C campaign in Pakistan. This event comes on the occasion of World Hepatitis Day, which is commemorated under global theme of One Life, One Liver, highlighting the importance of the liver for a healthy life and the need to scale up viral hepatitis prevention, testing and treatment. This is aimed to optimize liver health, prevent liver disease and achieve the 2030 hepatitis elimination goals. Globally, every year, viral hepatitis kills more than 1 million people and more than 3 million are newly infected. Pakistan is also suffering from the huge disease burden of hepatitis B and C infections and their devastating effects on the well-being of the population and health systems. The country now has the world's largest population of patients living with Hepatitis C. Out of 60 million Hepatitis C cases globally, Pakistan has 10 million cases. If remain undiagnosed and untreated, many cases will develop complications of liver disease and liver cancers. There is an urgent need to scale up viral hepatitis testing and treatment, too often the disease goes undetected until symptoms become serious. Now the manufacturers have announced to lower down the price of WHO pre-qualified hepatitis B and C drugs in low and middle income countries. This has been a concerted effort by partners to ensure affordability and accessibility to hepatitis treatment. These new drug prices will significantly reduce the cost of treatment and scale up hepatitis programs to meet growing demand all towards eliminating hepatitis. At the same time, WHO has introduced tools which are more effective than ever to prevent, diagnose and treat hepatitis. Also, WHO is supporting countries to expand the use of these tools to eliminate hepatitis and save lives. We are committed to working with all the governments and all partners to realize our shared vision of eliminating viral hepatitis by 2030 because we have one liver, one life. I thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is the end of the event and I would like to express my greatest uh, thanks to all of the invited guest speakers, international uh, uh, speakers as well. I hope that you would have enjoyed the show here at PKLI and PKLI is looking forward to have further collaborations and events on this special issue in future and hope to see you around and have a lovely evening tonight. Thank you very much.